Well, we all know what's in them thar hills, and in the Rockies, the fever is rampant. A downpour threatens to tarnish the Denver Gold's homecoming, but this town's support for the gold seems unshakable. And against the Oakland Invaders, Harry Sidney tries to raise a return on the fans' investment. Quarterback Ken Johnson, whose stock has risen lately, finds Boulder, Colorado native Bob Nizzolik to put six up on the big board. Going for broke, another Boulder native, Jeff Napple, goes to Larry Canada for a two-pointer. And with his team eight points in the red, Oakland's John Ralston goes to his ace, quarterback Fred Masson. Ex-Cardinal John Fairfield leaves the golden print. And next, the invaders Arthur Whittington is sent to the green by Putt Choate. In the early going, Denver's defense is doing all the invading, and Calvin Turner flattens Oakland's high-flying passing game. Things are out of whack and getting worse for the invaders as former Colorado quarterback Johnson looks for a Colorado receiver. Ex-Buffalo Vic James played at CU 10 years after Johnson, but now this tandem helps raise the goal lead to 22-zip. Masada's back on his feet, though, and Ralston's trying to convince his team there's still time. Masada has all the time in the world and uses it to spot Arthur Whittington for six points. Next, the league's leading passer looks for that trusty old tight end, Raymond Chester, whose recent renaissance includes 14 catches in two weeks and has Red Miller's defense slightly baffled. Masada finishes what he started with Chester. But even the two touchdown tosses leave Oakland 10 points down with time running out. Denver's Nate Miller gets in the way of a final Oakland invasion. And with its hard-fought 22-12 win, the gold is feeling solid. There's simply no shelter from the storm this week. But in Birmingham, a breed of young stallions is kicking up its heels against the Arizona Rangers. Earl Gann and his stablemates gain a league-leading 234 yards on the ground. And on defense, linebacker Herb Spencer, who's been shut off on the injured list, helps shut out the Wranglers through the first half. Arizona boss Doug Shively would like to kick his team's habit of getting behind, but Alan Risher just loves to play comeback. Trailing 9-0, Risher finds Neil Ball home, who takes this ball home to the Stallion 17. And from there, the electrifying Risher, who's not been intercepted once this season, puts his record on the line. Florida State's Jackie Flowers pedals free in the end zone, and the visitors are starting to feel quite at home. Trailing by just two, Arizona goes to Steve Howell for a key first down. And on fourth and one, Risher goes to Howell again. The league's stingiest defense holds them, and Howell. And now the Stallions' Bobby Lane has a chance to put Birmingham's first home win on ice. Lane's first down dive gets a 10 from head coach Raleigh Dodge and gives the Stallions a chance to introduce another unlikely success story. Meet Cornelius Quarles, a rookie from Howard University, who dashes for 90 yards in his first pro game. This 32-yard touchdown by Quarles seals a 16-7 win, and if Stallion fans fall for this new fella, Raleigh Dodge would have no quarrel at all. The USFL's intoxicating effect on Chicago extends from the chorus girls to daddy's little girls. But there's no hiding from the fact that George Allen's blitz has lost two straight, and LSU Campbell wants to make it three straight for the first time in Allen's career. Blitz quarterback Greg Landry is thinking short on fourth and three, but ex-Jet Kevin Long gets the first down with plenty to spare. In a game dominated by defense, Long again goes a distance, giving Chicago a 10-zip halftime lead. After intermission, L.A. conducts an emergency board meeting, and quarterback Tom Ramsey carries out a play designed expressly to get the visitors on the scoreboard. Former Montana State runner Tony Bode knows his X's and O's, and this 40-yard touchdown has him hiding in Chicago. With only a three-point lead, Landry is instructed to play it safe, and Tim Spencer is a sound choice to carry the ball. The league's third-leading rusher inspires the home folk to throw caution to the wind, and Landry floats one to tackle turn tight end Doug Cozen. Trailing by 10 again, it's Ramsey's turn for the old heave-ho. And wouldn't you know, Ricky Ellis brings L.A. back to within three. 
Campbell likes the fact that all of Chicago's past opponents scored on their last possession. But Ramsey's most eligible receiver is blitz safety Eddie Brown. And another winning streak begins for George Allen. A special tribute this week should go to number 52, Stan White, who makes an unassisted tackle on his teammate. But we think this week's most notable defensive performance came to the USFL straight from one of football's most glorious traditions. The Fighting Irish of Notre Dame groomed a talented young scholar-athlete named Joe Restick, who became an honorable mention All-American defensive back. Number seven is the son of the Harvard football coach. So how did Joe's dad feel about his choice? When I finally told him it was I was going to go to Notre Dame, I think he was just as happy as I was. And now everybody's happy for Restick, except the New Jersey Generals, that is. Number 38, Restick led the Boston Breakers to their come-from-behind win over the Generals by being in the right place at the right time. Currently a dental student at Pennsylvania, Restick is making Breaker fans smile by coming up with a big play. We're back at RFK Stadium. Rainy, cold Sunday afternoon, as we said, temperature 47 degrees. But Pete, you and Terry used to playing in weather like this, aren't you? This isn't bad weather at all. As a matter of fact, very comfortable. All right, no more talk about the weather. At least until the Washington Federals get the comfort of their first win. Against Michigan, Coach Ray Yock gives quarterback Kim McQuilk in the green light, and he responds through the airwaves. Looking, throwing down the sidelines, he's got home. He's got it at the pitch. The Feds are looking good, but the Panthers start clawing their way back, led by rookie quarterback Bobby Hebert, who ignores the muddy track and launches one to rookie sensation Anthony Carter. AC's first pro touchdown cuts the Fed lead to three, but Washington snaps right back, led by Allentown native McQuilkin, who employs his passing arm 48 times this day. Near the end of the first half, Yawk is looking for the touchdown sound, and he gives his quarterback one last chance to ring it up. Here's McQuilkin, looking across the middle of the Raiders. Fed fans can't keep the excitement under their hats, but McCulkin isn't exactly thrilled with the second half turn of events. Number 57, John Corker, keeps popping through Washington's offensive line. In all, the former Houston Oiler drills McQuilkin five times, and the beleaguered quarterback is coming up empty-handed. Looking for a familiar face, the ex-Atlanta Falcon quarterback finds former Falcon teammate Robert Pennywell, who wears the wrong color, and the turnover gives the Panthers an opening to pounce on. Bear, the league's third leading quarterback, finds himself in a state of controlled desperation, but then somehow finds the smallest player on the field, super smart Derek Holloway, who goes 69 yards for his fourth touchdown in two games. Down by only three, the Panthers put their trust in the toe of Novo Viova. Viovic's 43-yarder ties it up and creates the league's second sudden death overtime. Jim Stanley's Panthers are immediately put on the defensive as Washington wins the coin toss and starts a relentless drive downfield. He's back, throwing down the middle. Joey Walters' second touchdown catch from McCulkin gives the Washington Federals a 22-16 victory. The team's first and certainly one to save her. Now, no matter what the weatherman says, there's no rain on the Fed's victory parade. In case you're wondering what all this means, that is exactly what it feels like to win one after losing three. Let's ask the coach. Beats the other alternative, I'll tell you that. Well, when it comes to top-notch pass receivers, Rayot knows no better alternative than Joey Walters. A former star at Clemson, Walters became a Canadian football legend, catching 101 passes for Saskatchewan in 1982. who coached at Winnipeg, brought Walters to Washington three days before the start of the USFL's first season. The 28-year-old Walters changed his number to 87, but the rest remains the same. In four 
five games, Walters has caught 20 passes and three touchdowns to rank third in the league. And now with one victory under his belt, Joey Walters can join the rest of the USFL in a celebration of the ups and downs of football. I was lost on a winding road I thought that life had nothing left to give